The curved arrow formalism is a system designed to show us how electrons move in the course of organic reaction mechanisms. And it's a very important formalism to understand because it gives us insight into how reactions work and how we can modify reactions to make them go faster or work better for our purposes. So there are a few different things you're going to want to be able to do with curved arrows. Ultimately, what we'd like to be able to do is to predict what curved arrows are going to look like just on the basis of structures alone. But when you're first starting out, I think it's important to understand how curved arrows imply products that are already given, how we can go from reactants and products that are given to a set of curved arrows that shows the conversion of reactants to products, and types of problems like this, which are simpler applications of the curved arrow formalism, but help you see how curved arrows work. And they are a system. In other words, a curved arrow that, for example, connects a lone pair to an atom always has the purpose of showing a bond created between that atom involving the electrons of that lone pair. So curved arrows have well-defined meanings and it's a well-defined system. So when we're given reactants and curved arrows, the products are implied. The curved arrows are just a mechanism to show electron flow in a well-defined way. So in the example we're looking at here, we're looking at an acid-base mechanism in which the base, which in this case is methoxide, is pulling a proton from the acid, which is phenol. And the question asks, what are the products of the following acid-base mechanism? Curved arrows are given, so the curved arrows are showing us how electrons move. Curved arrows always begin at a pair of electrons that can serve as an electron source. And that's got to be a lone pair, a sigma bond, or a pi bond. In this case, the oxygen atom has three lone pairs, and the curved arrow, which is starting from the negative charge, indicates that a lone pair on oxygen is acting as the source. You'll sometimes see this notation where the arrow starts at a negative charge. That can be a little dangerous because a negative charge doesn't always imply the presence of a lone pair, but when it does, we take that negative charge to mean the lone pair sitting on that negatively charged atom, in this case, oxygen. So one of those lone pairs, I'll go ahead and highlight it in blue, is forming a bond to the hydrogen in phenol. That's what's implied by this curved arrow. What we're going to do when we draw the products is draw a bond between the oxygen of CH3O and that hydrogen. Now, were we to do that and nothing else, the hydrogen would have two bonds, right? And that's problematic. So we now need to start paying attention to the next arrow in the series, which shows how the hydrogen actually loses its bond to oxygen. So the pair of electrons connecting hydrogen to oxygen heads towards a new bond between oxygen and carbon. And so in the products, we're going to show this by first of all drawing hydrogen disconnected from the oxygen and phenol completely, and then drawing a new double bond between the carbon and the oxygen atom and phenol. And then finally, because that would create octet issues at this carbon here, we need one last arrow which lands on the ultimate electron sink, which is this carbon atom right here. And what this implies is we're converting a pi bond, specifically the pi bond implied within this double bond, into a lone pair on the atom at which that arrow terminates. So let's put all of these changes together and draw the products. Within the CH3O- or methoxide anion, the only thing that's changed is we formed a bond between the oxygen in CH3O- and the hydrogen in phenol. And I'll draw that bond in blue to signify that the pair of electrons within that bond is exactly that pair of electrons that used to be sitting on oxygen. The other two lone pairs, which we drew in red in the original reactants, we can still draw in red in the final products. Since the hydrogen lost its bond to phenol, we can draw phenol completely separately. And I'm going to start by drawing the six atoms of the six-membered ring, just like this initially. None of the sigma bonds were broken within phenol, and so we can still maintain this connectivity, and we can also still show the oxygen connected to one of the carbons of the six-membered ring. Now, as we can see with the green arrow, the OH single bond has moved into a double bond between carbon and oxygen, and so we can draw that new double bond in green there. And the double bond that used to exist between carbon and carbon, remember there was a double bond right here, is now a lone pair 
on one of the adjacent carbons. Since we've converted a bond which formerly contributed one electron to this carbon in the reactants into a lone pair which formerly contributes two electrons to that atom in the products, the charge on that carbon has gone from neutral to negative one. And notice that this makes sense in terms of overall charge conservation. We started with a negative charge on methoxide in the reactants. It makes sense that there should still be a negative charge in the products, which is counterbalanced by the sodium cation, which just acts really as a spectator in this reaction. Note also that the other two double bonds within the six-membered ring are unaffected. And so the final structure of the products looks like this. The Na plus cation, which was just a spectator, a derivative of a phenol in which we've lost the proton and the negative charge is sitting on this carbon, and methanol, which is the conjugate acid of methoxide. Methoxide picked up the proton to form CH3OH. The set of choices that matches these products is choice one. But notice that I didn't even look at the choices before I started drawing what the implied products were. This is a good practice when you're working through these types of problems, because it'll give you a sense of how curved arrows work and helps you be a little more exact when you're studying how curved arrows work. One other thing that's worth noting here is that if you're paying attention to the structure of this phenoxide anion, which is this anion right here, you may have noticed that the lone pair is susceptible to resonance, is involved in resonance specifically with the double bonds within the six-membered ring. All of these atoms form a contiguous set of p orbitals and an extended pi system. So resonance is relevant there. What that implies is that the set of curved arrows that we saw given here is not the only set necessarily that we could possibly have drawn. A second alternative set of arrows that is in every way, shape, and form equivalent to the curved arrows given here would involve continuing to push the lone pair throughout the pi system. So I won't show the results of this electron flow. You should try drawing it on your own, but for example, drawing a resonance structure in which the negative charge is located on this carbon, two carbons away from the one where we have it in the product drawn, is perfectly fine as well. 